very good morning good evening to everyone today thank you so much for making time for the reschedule session and and coming together to uh, to listen to us um, before we begin the session i just have a few housekeeping tips that i need to share with you all So the orange arrow on your control panel will help you close and open the control panel. You can use that so it will not block, block your visual. Uh, you can change your audio option anytime from your computer to your phone. All the attendees' microphones are muted. So if you have any questions, we urge you to please put them in the chat bar or the question section. At the end of the session, we are going to do a Q&A round and Professor Hanke will be taking the questions. Uh, this presentation is recorded, so the recording will be shared with everyone. And um, that's about it. I hope you all enjoy the session. Uh, for, for the next bit, I would like to invite uh, Professor Devasudi to uh, please take the stage and introduce the session and the speakers. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. As you are all aware, Sri Lanka is facing its worst economic crisis since its independence. Sri Lankan rupee has been depreciated by 57% since January 2022. Inflation is recorded as the highest ever in its history and rating agencies have downgraded the country as a restricted default. Considering the current economic crisis, we at the Faculty of Management Studies of the Sabaragam University of Sri Lanka in association with Emerald Publishing organized this intellectual dialogue as the need of our to advise the policymakers and the practitioners on the current economic situation and the way forward. With that note, I would like to invite Professor M.S. Maslam, Chairman of the Research and Publication Unit of the Faculty of Management Studies, Safaragam University of Sri Lanka, to deliver the welcome speech. Dear Professor Aslam, it is over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Professor Sri. I think it's an amazing, a great pleasure of, uh, you know, um, you know, giving me the opportunity to welcome this timely forum. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to the webinar on a nation on the brink of bankruptcy. Insight into the in, in, in Sri Lanka's inflation and currency crisis and the way forward. Organized by the Faculty of Management Studies, Sabaragam University of Sri Lanka, in association with the Emerald Publishing. This is a <clears throat> webinar is organized as a pre-conference workshop on the our annual research conference, seventh interdisciplinary conference of management researchers 2022. The annual research conference of the Faculty of Management Studies, it's a you know regular event every year week. Conduct, uh, you know, with the group networking of global academics and researchers. But with a great pleasure, let me first welcome the keynote speakers of this uh, today's session, Professor Steve <coughs> H. Hank from the John Hopkins University, U USA. So, Steve Hank is a professor of applied economics at John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, and USA. He is also a senior fellow and director of the Trouble Currencies Project at the Libertarian Carto Institute in Washington, D.C., and co-director of the John Hopkins University Institute of Applied Economics, Global Health, and the Study of the Business Enterprise in Baltimore. Marilyn, Professor <clears throat> Hank is known for his work as a currency reformer in emerging market countries. He is also known for his work on currency board, dollarization, hyperinflation, hyper water pricing, and demand benefit cost analysis, privatization, and the other topics in applied economics. So that he has written extensively as a columnist uh, for Forbes magazines. This is the first time Prof. Hank will be served as a keynote speaker at a webinar in Sri Lanka. Today, Prof. Hank will deliver his keynote speech on the current financial crisis Sri Lanka is going through, the possible path the recovery will take, an economic model 
His speech will be <clears throat> an eye opener for the industry practitioners, policymakers, as the country is nearly empty on its foreign currency reserves. Decreasing the <clears throat> ability to purchase the import and driving up domestic prices for goods. Meanwhile, President Devasri of Sabarka University of Sri Lanka will moderate the session. President Devasri holds a Doctor of Philosophy from University of Colombo, Sri Lanka, and <clears throat> currently serving as a brand ambassador at Ember Emerald Publishing for its uh, South Asian region. With a gratitude, let me also welcome Professor Atalo Nyanapala, Dean, Faculty of Management Studies, Sabaragam University of Sri Lanka. Then, with a gratitude, let me welcome our regional coordinator of the webinar, Ms. Sangeeta Menon, and Publishing Relations Manager, <coughs> Emerald Publishing. In fact, they have supported, <coughs> they supported a lot in making this program a great success. Then, with the gratitude, let me also welcome Ms. Disha Lakhanpal, Regional Marketing Manager, Emerald Publishing Group. Then with a great respect, I would like to welcome all distinguished participants from Emerald Publishing and the Sabaragam University of Sri Lanka. And last, but of course not least, audience mainly the industry practitioners, academic from all the universities worldwide and students and the researchers are welcome to the program for making the session a lively and a successful and fruitful event. Thank you, Professor Hank. It's over to you, sir. Please. Okay. Thank, thank you. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a pleasure to be able to address you today and, and to be able to technically connect. Uh, as you know, last week, for those of you who were with us last week. Uh, I had problems connecting, but we're connected, I think, in good shape today. What I will do in, in speaking today is be brief, uh, but very specific, and really give you some vignettes about what I see as the main problem facing Sri Lanka and, and how to solve it. And I will uh, relate my experiences in solving other similar crises as the one you're facing in Sri Lanka. So I'm talking not only as, as an academic, but as a practitioner who actually has solved many problems that are, were actually much worse than the ones that you're facing, if you can imagine that. Sri Lanka is facing uh, as we heard a few moments ago, a classic currency crisis in which the rupee has lost about 57% of its value since the first of the year. I measure inflation every day in Sri Lanka, and the inflation rate is, is not the official rate of 60.8%. It's 110% per year. So it's, it's almost double the, the official rate. Uh, and you can follow that by following me on the, my Twitter because I put those rates up uh, almost every day and you can see what's going on with inflation. What to do? That's the question. What to do if you have a currency crisis? And the main thing to do is, is take the cancer out of the system and the cancer is a central bank. You've got to mothball a central bank and put it in a museum. And then the question is, well, what do you replace it with? What kind of monetary authority do you impose if you don't have a central bank? And there are two options. One is what generally is called dollarization. It simply means using a foreign currency rather than a local currency. Right now, there are 33 countries in the world or territories that are dollarized. Uh, two of those, I've had firsthand experience in designing and implementing. One was in Montenegro, uh, where I was the a state counselor. And in 1999, the currency being used in Montenegro was the Yugoslav dinar. It was a hyperinflating currency, a really a junk currency. And 
we replaced that with the Deutschmark in December of 1999. And then subsequently, as soon as the Euro replaced the European currencies, including the Deutschmark, uh, Montenegro switched to the Euro. So it's, even though it's formally not a member of the Eurozone, it is informally a member, de facto a member, because it does use the Euro and is dollarized. The other country was in 2000, a year later, I was the advisor to the Minister of Finance in Ecuador, and we dollarized Ecuador and, and got rid of the local currency, the Sucre, which, which was junk currency, uh, more, more or less like the Sri Lankan uh, rupee. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is something called a currency board. There are 14 currency boards operating in, in the world today. Of course, the most uh, notable one is the one in Hong Kong. But four of the 14, I had a hand in designing and implementing. One in Estonia in 1992, Lithuania in 1994, Bulgaria in 1997, and Bosnia-Herzegovina in 1997. It turns out, what, what, well, what, is, what is a currency board? It's clear what dollarization is. You don't have a local currency, you use a foreign currency. A currency board is a monetary arrangement where you do have a local currency that is emitted by the currency board. That local currency trades at a fixed exchange rate and is freely convertible with an anchor currency. And the anchor currency uh, is something that backs the local currency being emitted 100%. So there's always, it's a fully credible system because there are 100% reserve coverage associated with every monetary liability that's issued by the currency board. And the local currency really becomes a clone of whatever the anchor happens to be. So it's the, the, the dynamics of the, of the scene are exactly the same as dollarization. You have a local currency, the local currency is a clone of the anchor. So it would be the operating in the same way as if you just had the anchor currency and no local currency. It has one feature that is different than the dollarization and that is you earn a profit. You have seniorage associated with a currency board because you're issuing a monetary liability that pays no interest. That monetary liability is backed 100% with anchor currency reserves that, are, that earn interest. And that differential is seniorage and, and a profit. There have been uh, 70 currency boards uh, historically. It turns out one of them uh, lasted a long time, and it was in Ceylon from 1884 to 1950. Of course, they dropped the currency board in 1950, and a year later, as you, you recall, you had a huge currency crisis, an economic crisis in Sri Lanka. Uh, one thing I should note when we're talking about currency boards, there's a lot of confusion about Argentina, a country I know a lot about, uh, because I was involved as an advisor to President Menem in the 1990s and, and also uh, Dr. Domingo Cavallo, who was a finance minister. The system they had in Argentina was not a currency board, was not a currency board. Most economists have no idea really what a currency board is, <laughs> so they never knew that the convertibility system that they had in Argentina, convertibility system, not currency board system, was what it was. And the reason that it was not a currency board is that it had a lot of discretionary power, which was used by the central bank, which was operating the convertibility system. And although it crushed inflation 
the hyperinflation that existed in 1991 when, when it was installed, eventually the discretionary monetary policies being followed under convertibility uh, created tremendous conflicts between monetary policy that was being imposed and the exchange rate policy that they had with convertibility. And the exchange rate policy was a fixed exchange rate, one to one between the Argentine peso and the US dollar. That was the exchange rate policy. The problem is they also had a monetary policy and those two became in conflict and the system blew up in 2001. That leads me to a, an important point about currency boards. Currency boards, there are no conflicts between monetary policy and exchange rate policy because you have an exchange rate policy, but you don't have a monetary policy. There is no discretion in a currency board and the discretion that can be detected by looking, since we're talking now with a faculty of accounting and today, that if you look at the accounts of the currency board on the asset side what happens you have no domestic assets and you have therefore no movement of those domestic assets and no discretionary monetary policy the only thing that's moving around on the asset side of the balance sheet are foreign exchange reserves if if the foreign exchange reserves go up the emission of domestic money goes up. If the foreign exchange reserves go down, the emission of domestic money goes down, all, all in a one-to-one -one relationship. So the key, the, the key here to either dollarization or a currency board system is that you get a hard budget constraint in the system. And a hard budget constraint is imposed because you've done away with the central bank, you've done away with the discretionary monetary policy, and you've done away with the emission of credit from a central bank. You, you no longer have a central bank that can emit credit to the fiscal authorities. So the fiscal authorities more or less are forced to do all the reforms necessary to, to do what? Balance the budget. The, the in currency board system countries, the, the budgets are always close to balance. Now let's go through the, the currency boards quickly, the, some of the key ones and the, and the ones that I've at least had some experience with e either directly or indirectly. Hong Kong in 1983, I only indirectly had con contact with that, and it was really my first introduction to currency boards because my colleague at the time was, uh, and good friend and collaborator actually, was uh, Sir Alan Walters. Now, Sir Alan was the economic guru of Margaret Thatcher at 10 Downing Street. And from July, most people don't realize this, but from July, until September 24th of 1983, the Hong Kong dollar had depreciated by 24%. So, so they had a currency crisis. And the architect of that system is someone I collaborate with, if you want to see my publications in the Wall Street Journal and whatnot, John Greenwood was the one who designed that system in close collaboration with Milton Friedman as you all know, a Nobel laureate, and Sir Allen, who was at 10 Downing Street. And, and ultimately, it, it was Sir Allen who convinced Margaret Thatcher that a currency board was the way to go in Hong Kong. And as they say, the rest is history. They put in the currency board on Black Saturday, September 24, 1983, and stability was immediately established. And the rest is history. Let's move to Estonia. Estonia is a currency board country, was until they joined the Euro, but when they became independent from the Soviet Union, they were using the Russian ruble. They didn't have a local currency, even though they were independent, even though they had no new constitution. And I wrote actually two books proposing and designing a currency board 
for Estonia. One, one of my collaborators in, in that effort was a, a collaborator I've had for many, many years, Dr. Kurt Schuler. Kurt Schuler, Lars Yoning, and I wrote these the two books that were proposing and designing a currency board for Estonia. I went to Estonia in May of 1992, and in June, they, they immediately decided this was the way to go. This was, they wanted to get rid of get rid of the the old Soviet ruble and replace it with their local currency, the kroon. And in a month, in one month, we put in a currency board system. It stabilized everything immediately. Everything worked beautifully. They eventually joined the 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 eurozone with with absolutely no problem and the main lesson here to keep in mind for sri lanka is that there are no preconditions to putting in a currency board no preconditions you don't have to do anything you don't have to restructure your debt you don't have to do do, do any kind of changes in regulation or anything else you put the system in and the system itself forces reforms that are necessary to allow the system to work with a hard budget constraint. So that was, that was the, the lesson, no preconditions, rapid installation in Estonia, rave reviews by the IMF and all the Article 4 subsequent reports that were done on, on Estonia. The next, uh, place where I had experience and was a state counselor was Lithuania in 1994. And at Lithuania what did not have a currency crisis at the time. And they had their own currency, the Litas. Remember, it, it, it was part of the Soviet Union and, and it just come out of a, an established independence. So they had already introduced their own currency. But the problem the prime minister saw at the time, he, he was the only one that realized the key to a currency board is a hard budget constraint. He couldn't control the fiscal affairs, even though he was a prime minister, even, even though his party, the old communist party, he was, it was a socialist party at the time. They changed their name to the socialist. <laughs> and, and, but he couldn't control a budget. And one way to control a budget, he'd been to Estonia, he saw how the system worked in Estonia, and right away, he was smart enough to realize that he could impose a hard budget constraint and control the, the, the political affairs, fiscal affairs by putting in a currency board. So we did that in 1994. Again, that received, although the IMF was, as usual, skeptical when the system went in, all the subsequent Article 4 reviews were rave reviews, giving the Lithuanians A plus grades and so forth. Then we had Bulgaria, where I was President Stoyanov's advisor. Bulgaria was witnessing a hyperinflation in 1996 and 1997. The inflation rate, by the way, in February of 1997 was 242% per month per month, not per year, per month. We put in the currency board in July of 1997 with fabulous results. Uh, the banks at the time we put the currency board in were insolvent. A year later, they were all solvent. Uh, they almost had no foreign exchange <laughs> to, be, to speak of when we started. They, they had enough to cover the value of the uh, Bulgarian lev that was emitted by the currency board, but but that that was small. The monetary base was pretty small. Reserves were pretty small. They tripled in one year, and within one year, the money market rates went down to 2.4 percent. The anchor currency was a Deutschmark, by the way, and and within one year, we we went from a hyperinflation of 242% per month and, and sky high nominal interest rates down to a money market rate of 
within one year. So everything was was stable within 30 days. Everything was completely stable. Inflation was essentially gone. It was it would have dropped to single digits within 30 days. And again, the typical pattern, the IMF had been very skeptical about the thing to start with, but all the subsequent IMF Article 4s were rave reviews, very high grades. And if you look at both Estonia and Bulgaria, it's interesting that Estonia has the lowest debt to GDP ratio of any European Union country, and Bulgaria has the second lowest debt to GDP ratio. And that's the hard budget constraint. That's what the hard budget constraint does. It, it, it puts the fiscal authorities and the politicians in a straitjacket. The, the last uh, currency board that I was in, uh, by the way, Bulgaria, just to give you some idea of the turnaround, in 1996, the GDP contracted 8%. 1997, it contracted 14.2%. And in 1998, the year after we put the board in, the economy was growing at 4.3%. So you swung around the GDP, which has always happened. You, you stabilize the prices and things start growing. The foreign, foreign reserves start booming because the demand for the currency is very high. And, and, and it's high because, because there's a huge arbitrage profit available once you put the currency board in because the interest rates in the local currency are much higher than the anchor currency so there's a there's a risk-free arbitrage which sucks tremendous amount of capital in and and, and has a, a big stimulative effect on the demand for the currency bosnia and herzegovina 1997 that that was a system that was mandated by the dayton peace accords that ended the Balkan Wars, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, under the Dayton Agreement, was required to have a currency board for the first six years of its existence. I helped put that currency board in. The Civil War hardly started the first time <laughs> that, that Mrs. Hankey and I went to Sarajevo. Uh, the only way to get in was to fly in, basically an airdrop to go in, but there were still snipers uh, fire, fire in Sarajevo, and it was, it was a pretty dangerous place. But the currency board was put in, and and, and the monetary system was stabilized, and, and the inflation was wrung out of the system almost immediately. So I think with that little introduction, uh, I will uh, conclude my organized remarks, and and we can move on. Yeah, Professor Hanke, can we proceed with the Q&A session now? Yes, indeed. Okay. So there is a one question from UK. Uh, Sri Lanka has a foreign loan portfolio of 51 billion USD. 
Professor Steve, do you think whether we can have either of two options you propose for Sri Lanka? What? Uh, this, this, I didn't quite hear the last part. I heard the. I heard the, the, the. Sri Lanka has a foreign loan portfolio of 51 billion USD. Professor Steve, do you think whether we can have either of two options you propose for Sri Lanka? Oh. It, it, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Look, look at the history of these things. They, 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 the, 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 the Bulgarian case, they'd actually defaulted on their domestic debt and, and their sovereign foreign debt before we put the currency board in. So this, this is a way, this is, you can't do anything unless you put in a currency board. That's my preference. And the reason it's my preference, you've had it before in Sri Lanka in the old days with Ceylon. So, so you, you've had it before. It's, it's, it's a great institution and, and, and it's one that actually generates a senior profit and, and, and you retain your domestic currency. So, so my, my inclination from a practical point of view is that the currency board is the best way to go. And it is one that is required if you are going to stabilize the situation. Stability might not be everything, but everything is nothing without stability. And you can't restructure debt, clean up banks and so forth, unless things are stable. And, and this gets back into the lesson I learned in Estonia. There are no preconditions, no preconditions to setting up a currency board. Everybody's wasting their time talking about the debt, the debt, the debt. We know the debt, that, that, okay. The key is stability. You have to stabilize the currency, stabilize the inflation rate, and then you can go into other problems that have to be dealt with. If you don't have stability, it's very difficult to do any reforms, to do debt restructuring or anything else. The, the hard budget constraint imposed by the currency board facilitates and makes it easier to move forward with all kinds of other problems that you have. But if you consider the current situation, so some lenders have already filled one court, court case in the USA and a few more cases are expected to follow. In that condition, do we believe that uh, uh, these two options may work? Of course. H history is the guide. We're, I, I'm, I'm not talking a, a theoretical lecture here in a, at a university classroom and, and this kind of baloney most people are talking about. I'm talking about real world experience. I, I put in two dollarization programs in bankrupt countries, Montenegro and, and Ecuador, and I've also installed four currency boards in, in completely bankrupt countries. So I know what I'm doing and talking about. This is this, I'm speaking about real world experience. So I can give you the answer. Yes, they work. very much for your answer. The second question, uh, Sri Lankan President, uh, Finance Minister got Parliament approval last Tuesday in order to print 1.7 trillion rupees to cover public expenses in the fourth quarter of the year. How would this affect the inflation in the country according to your calculation? Well, this is, a, this is an important point. No, number one, I, 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 I am measuring inflation every day in Sri Lanka. I'm the only one measuring it correctly. I'm using purchasing power parity theory and purchasing power parity theory allows you to look at changes in the exchange rate and translate those into implied inflation rates for the country. When the inflation rate is over 25% a year, this is the most accurate way to measure inflation. So I'm measuring it, not forecasting. You, you asked me to forecast inflation. To do that, you have to use a quantity theory of money. 
and, and in short, the quantity theory of money, MV, money times velocity equals PY, the price level times Y, the real rate of growth in the economy. If you look at that, you, 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 you know that in simple terms, if you're increasing M, you're, you're going to end up increasing ultimately P, which is a price level. So, so it's, it's adding fuel to the fire. <laughs> and, okay. and of course, of course that, 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 that is not going to be the case with a currency board because a, a currency board would increase by the way the money supply, but in a non-inflationary way. Because the only way you can increase the money supply in a currency board system, let's let's go through a little hypothetical, a little hypothetical now. Now we are going into the classroom. The hypothetical is you you set up a dollar-based currency board in Sri Lanka, and you, and the rupee would be tied to the U.S. dollar. It would be backed 100% with U.S. dollar reserves. What would happen? The interest rate initially on, 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 on rupee denominated assets would be higher than the interest rate on US dollar denominated assets. So you would have a, 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 a risk free arbitrage set up immediately. And like every currency board I've ever studied, and I've studied every single one of them, I've digitized every financial statement for every currency board that's ever existed in history. And I've had experience with four of them. And this arbitrage means that capital starts coming in immediately, foreign reserves start going up immediately. But when that happens, what happens? Why did they go up? Because the demand for the rupee would be going up. That's what sucks the money in. And, and if the demand for the rupee goes up due to this arbitrage, it will be a, a non-inflationary increase in the money supply. The money supply will go up, but the inflation rate will be roughly comparable to the inflation rate in the anchor currency country. So thank you very much for your wonderful answer. So uh, with that, uh, there is another one question. So we can see that there is a huge difference between the actual calculation and the official calculation of the inflation. So uh, uh, Professor Steve, can you please explain the process of the calculation using the purchasing power parity in your calculation? Okay, the, I, I've kind of done this once without, without going through the, the, the algebra and the thing. The, the uh, let me let me refer to you. Uh, there's an article that I wrote that goes through all the theory and calculations and everything. It's it, it's Charles Bushnell and myself co-authored this paper. It's in the Journal of World Economics. Journal of World Economics. I I can't remember the year right now. I think it was uh, it, it was four or five years ago. That. I've written many articles on this. You can Google around and, and find find them, but that that's one that's 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 very clear. There's another one that's a little bit more complicated that I wrote with Alex Kwok, and and I think that was published in the Cato Journal in I think 2009. If you go to go to my website at the Cato Institute. And, and just plug in Zimbabwe, and, and you'll you'll find this article, Cato Journal. It's on Zimbabwe, where where we estimated the hyperinflation rate in Zimbabwe in 2008. We're in a peak at uh, over 87 sextillion percent per year. Now that's that's a number most people don't understand, but what you, you can get that down to how fast was the price level doubling and it was doubling in a little over 24 hours every 24 hours the price level was going up it was the second highest hyperinflation in world history now here's here's the here are the steps you 
you use purchasing power parity theory. That's that's the theory behind it, which is a tried and true theory. Uh, Cassell's uh, basically invented purchasing power parity in the 1890s. It's been used ever since. It is if you take the exchange rate changes between uh, on, on a daily basis and, and the inflation differentials between whatever the two cu currencies are that you're using and translate it in, into an implied inflation rate, you, you come up with the estimate that I have for Sri Lanka, which happens to be 110% per year today. I, I just measured it today, 110%. Now, what is that actually? That is the price level that's changing for everything in the economy, whereas the official exchange rate is a basket of a much smaller basket of, of goods and, and services. The purchasing power parity measure is everything. Every it, it's more it's more in in line with like a GDP deflator. And, and, and it's even broader than that because it's taking into account all prices in the economy, all asset prices, goods prices, service prices, every everything. So it's a it's a it's a basket that think of it this way: it's a basket that contains every price that's moving around in Sri Lanka is included in the thing. But but I I would refer your uh, I guess to the the, the Hanky Bushnell article in the Journal of World Economics, uh, and and that that article goes through it ver very clearly, simply, and you can see why when inflation is over about 25 percent per year, that it that it matches up perfectly. You you get a perfect match with measured inflation and and the implied inflation you get out of the purchasing power parity model so uh, in the meantime we will share the reference to that um, article so you will be able to know how the calculation is made so with that uh, we can proceed with the next question sir why the fiscal and monetary failed in financial shocks can't we anticipate the crisis in today's modern era well the the, the reason the fisc as i understand the question the reason these fiscal talks fail and and and, and the reason you, the, the reason you've had 16 imf programs in sri lanka and everyone has failed everyone has failed if, if they'd been successful you wouldn't be going back to the IMF trying to get a 17th program. So this one will fail for the same reason. You have a central bank. That's the reason they fail. And a central bank in, injects a soft budget constraint in the system. The central bank can print money. You just said the, the parliament just approved the printing of what what how, how many billion rupees 1.7 billion rupees <laughs> so that they could pay civil servant that 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 can't exist that kind of discretion does not exist with a currency board or a dollarized system and and that means that the fiscal authorities are put in a straitjacket and they ha they have to behave the the fiscal authorities don't have discretion you have a monetary authority that has no discretion, and and de facto the fiscal authorities are put in a straitjacket, and they don't have any discretion. They have to balance things. You you basically with the currency board of dollarization, you you pull a plug on this soft budget thing, and that's why Sri Lanka is in one crisis after another. And unless they get rid of the central bank, they will continue to be in crises. And the rupee will continue to have problems. That that's one prediction I can make with a hundred percent accuracy. By the way, very much, sir. 
with that there is another one question how will the change into dollarization of currency board affect entrepreneurs in sri lanka so what is your view on it oh the the entrepreneurship will boom uh, entrepreneurs operate when things are stable when when they when the overall environment is stable and and, and now what what are entrepreneurs spending all their time uh, worrying about how how to hedge about the the rupee that's that's junk what to do about the rupee that's junk they they can't even import things because they have a junk currency so so they don't have to worry about that anymore there 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 are no currency problems to worry about there there are no worries that the fiscal authorities are going to get the country in a in a huge problem with debt and 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 they can get on with being entrepreneurs doing business so it's it's fabulous for entrepreneurs it's fabulous because the the entrepreneur typically is, is the cleverest one in the system you see and and now what are they doing well they're probably speculating on the currency instead of doing business So thank you very much, sir. Uh, there is another question uh, from Professor Dayaratna. Will IMF bailout package work for Sri Lanka in short run? What do you think? No, it won't work. They, they've never worked in the past and it's not going to work now unless, unless you have a currency board. Now, we, ha we had an IMF program in, in Lithuania. It worked be because of the currency board. We had an IMF program in Bulgaria. It worked. We had an IMF program in, in, in Bosnia Herzegovina. We also had one in Estonia. They work in all those places. And if you look at the IMF Article 4 reviews of the of all those four countries, Estonia, Lithuania, Bulgaria, and Bosnia, the reviews are all excellent, excellent. That's that's if you if you want excellent IMF results and you want to get the biggest bang for your IMF dollar and and you want to get off off of the association that you have with the IMF eventually and 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 not have to go back for the 18th 19th 20th 21st program you put in a currency board other otherwise they won't work and 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 if you have the central bank you're just going to keep going back over and over and over again for an IMF bailouts. And and who will you be in debt to? You'll be in debt to the IMF. You know, every, everybody's going on and on about China, China and Sri Lanka. The, the, uh, China only holds 10% 10, 10 of the debt. The rest of the rest of, uh, of the debt held, held, is held by other parties in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. You are exactly correct. So, uh, sir, what do you think instead of currency, what other strategies Sri Lanka needed to strengthen economic stability? What are the other strategies we can use for the same? Well, I the 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 first thing and and, and the, the first big thing you, you have to do big things. And the first big thing is to change the monetary system itself, and that's the currency board. So that that's focus on first things first. Don't don't get out ahead of everything. You you we know there are a lot of other problems. You're going to have to restructure the debt, okay? So that that's another big problem. But but that becomes a lot easier if you have a currency board to to do it. You you also I I don't know the precise detail because I haven't done the sharp pencil work required and the due diligence for the banking system. But there are probably some things that are going to have to be done with the banking system, and and, and the the rest of it really starts taking care of itself. If the if the politicians know they're facing a hard budget constraint, and the fiscal authorities know they're facing a hard budget constraint, they they will do what it takes. You don't have to worry about it. It's spontaneously going to happen. They can't go to the central bank 
and tell a central bank to print money. And if that's the case, they will change their behavior. Thank you very much, sir. With that, we do have another question. Professor Henke, can we adopt a free market policy like what Chile and West Germany adopted to get rid of similar situation to what Sri Lanka is experiencing today? Instead of exchange controls, import bans and money printing. I, I, I like the, uh, the answer to that is yes. And, 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 the, and, and the model I like to bring forward that's actually in your region is, is Singapore. Singapore became independent in 1965. It, it was extremely poor, very, very poor. And, and there were tremendous ethnic divisions, as you know, between the, the Malays, Chinese, and Indian populate ethnic ethnics. They, they were almost going into a civil war at, at that time, 1965. So what happened? Well, they had a leader, Lee Kuan Yew. Lee Kuan Yew came. He, he put in the currency board. That was the first thing they did. So they had stability. And, and then there, there were a number of free market reforms that he put in that made Singapore what it is today, the second richest place in the world. They were the, one of the poorest countries in the world in 1965. So what were the free market reforms? Number one, he wanted to make the Singaporean businesses competitive. And so he had a complete free market, free trade, free trade. That was one thing. That's how you introduce competition. You introduce competition by allowing free trade. The second thing he did was to small government, small government, no corruption, small government, no corruption. Uh, pay, pay civil servants, get high quality civil servants and, and pay them first class wages. Then protect private property and ensure public safety. That was, that was another key thing that he did. So you, you had a, a visionary, Lee Kuan Yew, and, and that, that was what happened. I mean, the first thing he did was a currency board, by the way. And, and another element in that, he refused to take foreign aid, no IMF money, no money from World Bank, no money from anybody. He didn't pass the begging bowl. They had a very strict do not pass the begging bowl policy. So, so that, that was the model and, and it worked like a charm. And in and, and Chile, of course, the Chicago boys, that, that worked like a charm. Uh, and, and, and we have that model now. Unfortunately, they're un, unwinding that. And, and uh, they're really in big trouble in Chile right now. But in the, in the 70s, when the Chicago boys were putting in the free market, they, they, they put in all kinds of free market reforms, including private social security. The biggest thing was private social security. The big mistake they made, the big mistake they made was the, the exchange rate system. They, they left the central bank in, they had a pegged exchange rate with some fixity in the exchange rate, but they also had a discretionary monetary policy. So an exchange rate policy and a monetary policy, they became in conflict and the whole thing blew up and they had a big crisis. In, in the early 1980s, huge currency crisis, huge banking crisis, which set the the Chicago boys' reform back. By the way, it was a, it was a huge problem. If they would have done a currency board, that would have not have happened. They would have been more like Singapore. So I think you should you should if if you're really interested in free market reforms. Your neighbor, Singapore, and the region is the place to look. Thank you very much, sir. So, uh, inflation can be considered as one of the issues placed by the world. So, uh, what are the other countries do you think that are most likely to face bankruptcy due to inflation in the world? Well, uh, 
it's a fairly long list. I don't have it in front of me right now, but it, we, there, 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 there are many that are in. Well, we've got obviously Argentina is in the same state. Ghana, in in Africa, Sri Lanka. You know, these are these are all all countries that are in terrible shape. You you have now. But I think there are 12 countries that have inflation rates, uh, 12 that I follow, inflation rates over 25% per year. So the, the, all of those on that list would be possible. We, we, you, you said inflation is a global problem. Now, one thing to remember, inflation is not a global problem. It's a local problem created by local central banks. There are some countries that have very low inflation rates. China has a pretty low inflation rate. It has all the same problems that everybody else does, but they they use, they use follow the quantity theory of money. They, they follow Milton Friedman's monetary type policy in China. They have pretty low inflation. There's low inflation in Japan right now. There's pretty low inflation in Switzerland right now. Uh, they, they, the, the, the big countries that have bad inflation problems, US, UK, EU, those, those are the big, and then you, all, all these other countries, you, you have at least 100 countries that have inflation problems, by the way, and really should get rid of their central banks and put in currency boards. I, I, I have an article in uh, this, early this week, Tuesday's Wall Street Journal, in which I talk about this. See my article in Tuesday's Wall Street Journal, and I, I recommend getting rid of about 100 central banks and replacing them with currency boards. The central banks do not perform well. You have, you have to get rid of them. So uh, with that, there is another question. Continuous. Uh, foreign debt will increase the crisis. How to getting out of a debt fall and what is the way to manage debt flu blueprint for Sri Lanka? What is the role of politicians for that? Well, the first thing, again, is you, you have to stabilize the system and, 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 and then once you stabilize, you can start focusing on, obviously, you're going to have to restructure the debt so that so uh, restructuring it, and, and that, that's the old debt. And everything will be sustainable with a currency board because the fiscal authorities will be more or less in a straight jacket where they can't, they can't get into trouble. It's, it's, a, it's a central bank that allows them to get into trouble. That's, that's what people don't realize. You must have a hard budget constraint in a country like Sri Lanka that has that has very flawed in fiscal institutions and, and political institutions. The, the politicians get in trouble in Sri Lanka. So what do you do? If you have somebody that gets in trouble and, and is insane, you put a straitjacket on them. That's what straitjackets are for. They're for, pe they're for containing people that normally get in trouble. There is one another one view. So, uh, Professor, thank you for sharing your valuable experience in solving real-world crisis situations. Sri Lanka needs drastic reforms, both in the economics and politi political spheres, in order to bring about stability. But we do not know how and when these reforms happen. How seriously is these delays affecting the current crisis, according to your estimation, sir? Well, the delay is a, a huge problem, huge problem. And, and this, this gets back to Estonia. Estonia, remember, I, I said the steps, I wrote two books, one in English and one, the same book was translated into Estonian. Okay, the, the, the Estonians invited me then, then, by the way, they didn't even have a new constitution. So who did I address? I addressed the Supreme Soviet, the Supreme Soviet 
in Estonia. I addressed them in May of 1992, and they decided immediately, immediately they saw the way to get rid of the biggest problem they had, which was the Russian ruble and the fact they didn't have their own currency. They saw the light, and the light was a currency board. And in June 20 of 1992, we put the currency board in. So that, that was that was a one month. There was no delay. One month. And, 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 and by the way, notice what I'm saying. They didn't even have their own currency at the time. We had to, we had to, we had to print the new currency. They, they, they had the reserves, by the way, because they, in, in World War II, when the Nazis invaded uh, Estonia, prior, prior to that invasion, they, Estonia shipped its gold to London. And so there were, they had gold reserves in London. We used those. But the whole thing we did in 30 days, this waiting around, you're going to wait forever, by the way. The, the IMF, the IMF is going to force you to do all these preconditions before you can get an IMF loan. And the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank have said that they are going to make you wait too. They're not going to do anything. So you're you're going to be waiting forever. This is this has been going on in Lebanon for over two and a half years. The IMF keeps telling them to wait, do, do all these preconditions before anything can happen. And 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 I say baloney. There are no preconditions with the currency board. You just do it and and get on with it. But but one one problem, the problem that has to be overcome is that the elites. The, the same old elites run Sri Lanka that, that, that have always run Sri Lanka. And you have to convince them that the currency board is the way to go. You have to convince the elites that they should put on a straitjacket. And, and it would be good for them because it would be good for Sri Lanka. And, and it would stop the crisis. And I can tell you right now, my experience any any leader in Sri Lanka who would be behind the currency board and put it in would solve the inflation problem, would stabilize everything, and would be a national hero. Any Sri Lankan politician who does this, I can guarantee you, will be a national hero, guaranteed. And I, and I can go right down the line of, of all these leaders I've been associated with. It's always the same. So I'm talking about real politics here. You, you must get a local respected politician in the old elite that grabs onto this idea and does it because whoever that is will, will be a national hero. It'll be, it'll be a wonder, wonderful thing for their political career. There'll be a statue down, down in the center of Colombo of whoever this politician is. Thank you very much for your wonderful answer, sir. Uh, so uh, next question. So we do have uh, two similar questions. I will put it in this way. If Sri Lanka enters into a currency board in order to stabilize the inflation and domestic currency, do we need to contemplate an exist strategy to leave the currency board when the economy recovers? What is your opinion? No, no. you should never leave it. You should just be like Hong Kong. Look at Hong Kong. You, you don't leave it. Why? Why? Why would you leave it? Num number one, why? Why would you even think about it? it's madness? It would. It, it's madness. E every country that, by the way, the, let's go back to the history. The, so currency boards. You say, uh, well. If currency boards are so wonderful, Professor Hankey, why, why, why did we, we used to have about 70, we only have 14 today. Why, why did you get rid of all those currency boards if they were so wonderful? What happened after World War II, most of the currency boards, most, not all, not all but most were British colonial institutions. 
So after World War II and, and independence of the colonies, all institutions that were viewed as being colonial were, were abandoned. That anything colonial was bad. Even, even though if they were working right, they were seen by the locals as being bad. So that, that was one reason that they got rid of them. The other thing is Keynesian economics was coming in strong after World War II. And the idea was that you could fine tune the economy and, 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 and avoid having business cycles, up, avoid having ups and downs. And that required a central bank. You needed a central bank to fine tune monetary policy. So that was the second reason. The third reason was that we had the Bretton Woods Agreement of 1944, and the Bretton Woods Agreement established the World Bank and the IMF. And central, new central banks were seen by the IMF and the World Bank as, as wonderful things because it meant jobs for the boys. It meant jobs for the IMF employees because the job the IMF employees had to go out into these newly independent countries and teach people how to run a central bank. So you had three, it was a perfect storm that got that got rid of them. Now there were other central banks that were abandoned for a few for other reasons. For example, the, the North Russian Central Bank was established by John Maynard Keynes in 1918, and, and, and that was an institution that, that was founded by the white Russians. Well, the Reds won the Civil War, and the whites lost. So they, had, they, they shut down the currency board. Everybody redeemed, by the way, those currency board rubles from that currency board in London because the reserves were kept in London and 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 their 100 percent redemption even after the civil war ended even after the whites lost the civil war the currency board did, didn't uh, those people that had currency board rubles in white white Russia did not lose any money they redeemed all those rubles for for gold so, so the idea of getting rid of it, I, I think, I think, it, I, quite frankly, is just a stupid idea. So, uh, with that, actually, when I was listening to your wonderful talk, I was thinking about what are the disadvantages of a uh, uh, currency board. So, if you consider about fixed exchange rate regimes. So currency boards that doesn't allow the government to set their interest rates. That means economic conditions in a foreign country usually determine interest rates, which is a disadvantage. How a country can manage this issue? No, it isn't. It's exactly the opposite. It's, a, it's an advantage. The, the interest rates in the United States, let's, let's say the, it depends on the anchor, of course, but let's say you have, you use the world's currency. The world's premier currency is the U.S. dollar. There's no question about it right now. And you're telling me that the central bank in Sri Lanka has a, has a better interest rate policy than the Federal Reserve in the United States? It's a joke. Yes. It, 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 you don't want, that's the whole point, you don't want a domestic interest rate policy determined locally by a local central bank. You want to do what Hong, why do you think Hong Kong does so well? Because their interest rates shadow the interest rates in the United States. They, 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 they have no authority over interest rates because they have no monetary policy in Hong Kong. No monetary policy in Hong Kong. They have an exchange rate policy, 7.8 Hong Kong dollar for one US dollar. That's it. That's the policy. This, 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 this is madness. This, this, this is why you want to get rid of 100 central banks around the world that produce junk currencies 
and and volatile interest rates and uncertainties that that in fact hold back businesses because businesses are spending all a lot of their intellectual capital is spent on trying to manage their exchange rate risk in all, all these countries. By the by the way, by the way, one 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 point slightly related to the question right before, as well as your question, both of these questions is well what happens if the anchor goes bad? Let's let's say let's say that you have you're using the US dollar and for some reason it it, it goes bad. Well, you can always change the anchor with a currency board. And the the laws, all the currency board laws that Kurt Schuler and I have devised, always have a systematic way to exit the currency board. In other words, if the anchor becomes bad, there are rules set in place, and the rules dictate how you automatically go into another anchor. So you don't get rid of the currency board. You, you get rid of you get a new anchor that's that's superior. Thank you very much for your wonderful explanation, sir. So with that, we do have another question from one of our regular participants. Which point of the hyperinflation rate is too late to install a currency board to a country? Oh, it's never too late. It, 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 hope, hope, hopefully you won't get into, uh, by the way, if if you had a hyperinflation, you would have to have inflation rates of 50% per month or, or more, which you, which you don't have in, in Sri Lanka. So you, you don't have hyperinflation in Sri Lanka, but the experience I've had with, with Estonia, uh, Bulgaria, uh, those were two hyperinflation countries, and it, it stopped them Im immediately. I mean, with, within days, in, in Bulgaria, within days, the hyperinflation stopped. So, uh, and, that is and by, by the way, uh, let's, let's go to one case of dollarization. Zimbabwe hyperinflated, the, the second highest hyperinflation in world history in November of 2008 and and in 2009 they officially dollarized the country and 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 the the hyperinflation disappeared completely and and, and the economy started growing the economy started growing at over 11% per year in in that year that they had dollarization so no inflation very rapid economic growth so, so you can dollarize or put a currency board in, e even with tremendous hyperinflations like Zimbabwe's, where the prices were doubling every 24 hours. So, uh, there is one another question with regard to the lender of last resort. So, if we establish a currency board, uh, that currency board can they work? as uh, in order to proceed with the lender of last resort for if a bank is in a trouble oh no they 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 can't uh, the currency board can't it's a hard budget constraint the only the only way that you could have lender of last resort is to go to the fiscal authorities and have have a budget out of the budget but remember the fiscal authorities will be in a straight jacket so they they will be very careful about about any kind of lender of last resort and by the way it's it not having a lender of last resort is is actually a good thing not a not a bad thing because it, it, the lender of last resort creates a moral hazard problem and and incentivizes bad behavior on the part of banks if banks know they are not going to be bailed out banks will be much more careful than they are if they think they can go to the politicians and get a bailout. So, uh, 
with that answer, so I would like to put uh, another question from Nalaka Geekyanagi. In if Sri Lanka chose to dollarize the rupee, how does it affect the purchasing power of the ordinary people? What do you think, sir? Well, num num number one, it, this de this depends on the exchange rate that is is used to put it in. So it's kind of a hypothetical question. It's impossible to answer because you you have to you you have to uh, I could devise a an exchange rate that would 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 not affect anybody right now, and at that exchange rate, the key is their purchasing power going forward go would go up, not down. But but it, it, it's the the question gets into a hypothetical because it depends on uh, it. It depends on the exchange rate. With that, we do have another question. Uh, Professor Steve, under a currency board system, domestic currency can only be issued if it is backed up by central bank holdings of a specific foreign currency. Thus, uh, thus can Sri Lanka continue to print money as pointed out in a previous question to cover its fiscal expenses? No, not with a currency board. the the on, The only way the government could 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 obtain rupees from from a currency board, the the government would have to take foreign exchange into the currency board and exchange it for rupees. So if the government had foreign exchange, they could get rupees. But 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 the 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 the, the, rup, the budget will have to be financed a hundred percent by taxes. And, and by any bonds or borrowing that the government does. That's the only way. You cannot go to the central bank and have them print rupee with a currency board. That's that's the whole point of the hard budget constraint. And that's why they discipline. That's why they discipline the system. The, the, reason, the reason politicians in Sri Lanka are not disciplined and the reason Sri Lanka gets in trouble over and over again is the central bank. They, the politicians know the central bank is a moral hazard itself because the politicians know they can go to the central bank with a, with a gun at the governor's head and say, oh, look, we, we have some wonderful Sri Lankan bonds that we want to sell you. And, and, and and the governor says, well, I I don't want to buy them, and they 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 start pulling the trigger back, the hammer back on the pistol, and they say, oh no, you really want to buy these, and and you will print money to finance them. Thank you very much for your wonderful answer, sir. With that, we do have another question from one of the participants, uh, regular participant. Um, if the crisis, crisis get further deepening and Sri Lanka approach to a banking crisis, will the currency board still be effective in this situation? For an example, losing the control of monetary policy in the absence of the central bank. Oh, yes. It, it, yeah, it, 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 absolutely. The, the, the worse the crisis, it, it leaves only one option, two options, either dollarization or a currency board. The worse you get, you know the only option that will save it is, in fact, a currency board. And, 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 and by the way, the banks, the banking association should be 100% behind a currency board. They should be the ones that really want the currency board. And, and the evidence about that Look at Bulgaria. The whole banking system was insolvent in July of 1997 when we put in the currency board. One year later, the system was completely solvent. And 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 what happens? What happens? It's the arbitrage. The demand for the local currency increases tremendously, and this is this is great for banks. It's terrific for banks. So uh, we do have one question from India. So how will Sri Lanka deal with the long and short uh, 
long-term demands of China, even as it navigates the current economic turmoil, as China will certainly not back down from its demands about its share of the uh, pie, given the amount China has invested in Sri Lanka? Okay, number, number one, you have to put this in context. China has a small portion of the debt, so, so there's a there's a huge misunderstanding about this. China has 10% of the total debt. So it's, but it's so, in relative terms, it's fairly small. The reason this has been magnified is, is that you have a, a situation, you, you have a hybrid war going on between, on one side, the United States, and the other side, China. So, th so this is all being magnified by the U.S. and the U.S. allies versus China. So how will you handle that 10 percent? That's the question. And, and my, my suggestion is you handle it carefully. China, China is a great power. You don't want to screw around with China. And, and, and by the way, this is precisely why you want a currency board, so you stay out of the problem of being over indebted. Because once you get over indebted, the the creditor is is going to run the show, not not Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is not running the show. China is running the show. The U.S. The U.S. is running the show. The IMF is running the show. The World Bank is running the show. And the question's coming from India. India's running the show. <laughs> of course, indeed. So uh, with that, we do have another question. What will happen to the large public sector? 1.5 million state employees if the currency board is introduced. In addition to that, we do have a similar question. So um, we do have free facilities to the public, and is this an issue for a healthy economy? Okay, all, all these things with the currency board, the, the whole budget will have to be rethought and, and, and organized in such a way that it's balanced. This happened in Bulgaria, by the way. Remember, they, they, were, they, were, they were a communist country. And, and, and until 1990, and, and in 1997, it all changed with the currency board. And, and by the way, between 1990 and 1997, they had two sovereign debt defaults and, and, and one domestic debt default. So they had all kinds of problems. All this is going to be reformed. It's clear, by the way, that, that one, of the, one of the big problems, and one thing that will have to be done, is that this, the military expenditures are 12.3 percent of the 2022 budget, and the military personnel, 1.5 percent of the population in Sri Lanka. It's the second highest in the world. Israel is the only country higher, with 2 percent of its population being in the military. So, so the whole military thing clearly is 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 a big problem. So. That 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 will have to be looked at and dealt with, and with a currency board, it will be. It will be. So I, I can't give you what the solution is. The local po the Sri Lankan politicians will be forced to run the show with a currency board. They will be forced to look at the budget and figure out what to do that's in the best interest of Sri Lanka. That, that's what happens. It, it'll be automatic. You don't need Professor Hankey or the IMF or some China or somebody else telling Sri Lanka what to do. Sri Lanka will figure it out themselves. That's what they did in Bulgaria. That's what they did in Estonia. That's what they did in Bosnia. That's what they did in Lithuania. That's what they do in Hong Kong. So thank you very much, sir. Uh, with uh, that, uh, so we can have another question. 
So, dear Professor, how does arrival of digital currency in future affect to establishment monetary board in Sri Lanka? Uh, I, I, could you repeat that question again? Uh, dear Professor, how does arrival of digital currency in the future affect oh, uh, okay. to establishment I, monetary board of Sri Lanka? I, I, I think it's irrelevant. Yes. So uh, with that, uh, so we do have another 10 to 15 questions. So uh, can we proceed with that, sir? What about your time? We, we can, well, we can proceed. What about your time? You're in the middle of the night over there. <laughs> yeah, no worries, no worries. We can proceed with it. We, uh, we, well, pr we're going to proceed. I'm, I'm going to give short answers. If we, okay. if, whatever, whatever, whatever the inventory of questions is, I'll answer all of them and answer them quickly. Okay, superb, superb. So we are getting some more comments also. So, uh, so I'm not going to repeat the comments and all. So I'll send you the feedback at the end of the session. So uh, impact on India of Sri Lanka crisis and what India should learn from Sri Lankan crisis. So we discuss a bit about India. Well, I think I think I think it would be wonderful if, if India would go to a currency board. <laughs> the, 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 the the reserve bank's performance has, has been not bad, but it, I, I mean the reserve bank in India. I'm talking about it, it. It hasn't been bad, but it's it's nothing. As they say in America, it's nothing to write home about. <laughs> And, and 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 the Indian rupee is nothing to write home about either. It's 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 not a it's not a it's not a significant currency or an important currency. I think in India would, would if if they had a currency board and and a, and a rupee issued by the currency board, I really think in India would take off. Yes, indeed. So uh, there is one another question. Uh, what could be the possible effect on the real sector of the economy? For an example, growth, unemployment, um, and so on. Uh, if you consider a move to a uh, system like currency board or dollarization, what do you think? Oh, the real the real economy is really what benefits because you 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 take you take inflation out. Look at it this way. Nominal GDP is made up of what? It's made up of a real GDP plus the residual is inflation. What if you take the residual out of that? You take it you, you take it out. We've talked about this with the entrepreneurial kind of question. The real economy just picks up because you have a lot less risk in the system. You don't you don't have currency uncertainty, currency volatility. And and you have stability uh, with with a big and and by the way one one thing you would automatically get you you get a lot lower interest rates you you have two you have a, so many things going on that help the real economy but one is lo, lower lower nominal interest rates number one and and you get a huge capital inflows. Huge capital inflows. So, so that and those capital inflows, of course, are used to finance what real economic activity. So it's 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 a wonderful thing for the real sector. So, if I have not mistaken, sir, Sri Lanka has taken a decision in July 2020 in order to reduce the statutory reserve requirement. Can you hear me? Am I audible, sir? The, the, the reserve requirements? Yes, uh, Sri Lanka has reduced the statutory reserve requirement in July 2020 to the highest lower, uh, that is 2%. So uh, do you think that it has impacted the inflation? Well, it does affect it because broad money is produced by banks. I mean, 
mo most of the money in an economy is, is, is not really produced by the central bank. Central bank only produces monetary base. The, the, the broad money is produced by the banking system. And, and, and if the instrument used for monetary policy is a reserve requirement, and you reduce the reserve requirement on commercial banks, you increase broad money and the money supply. So, so the answer to that is yet, yes, it has contributed to the inflationary problems. That uh, we do have some more questions. How long will it take Sri Lanka to come out of this tragedy, at least in a decent level? So if we implement the currency board. Well, let's, let's talk about two stages. And, and I'm talking about this, this is not theory. I'm talking about, you know, what I did in Bulgaria. I know exactly what happens. The, the inflate, the, number one, the, 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 the currency would be stabilized immediately on day one, day, the, the first second, on, on the first second, this currency would be fixed to whatever the anchor was. Then the inflation would be smashed in the system, and 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 that would be completely wrung out of the system. I I think within 30 days, or or less, or less. Now, going beyond that, kind of the second state, so that establishes stability. Within within 30 days, everything is stabilized. Then within a year, you're going to see very big changes in the real economy, in the foreign exchange reserves, solvency and health of the banking system. Let's just say roughly a year. So, so you've got a, like a 30-day window when everything, everything gets stabilized, every, everything is normal, and then give, give about, about a year for, you know, it, it's, it's, it's going to get improved during the year. But by the end of one year, at the end of one year, if you look back, things will be a lot better at the end of one year than they were when you installed the currency board. So with that, we do have one question from uh, Sampat Vikram Singh. Will the money supply in the economy suddenly shrink after adoption of a currency board, especially when a country is alarmingly Law on foreign reserves. What do you think? Oh, it, it'll it'll be exactly what happened in Bulgaria. We put the currency board in in July of 1997. One year later, the foreign reserves were three times higher than they were when we installed the currency board. So you'll get an explosion of foreign reserves because of arbitrage. I mean, you you get you get everybody in there. All the all the Indians will be pouring money into into Sri Lanka because they'll get a much higher interest rate and rate of return on, on Sri Lankan rupees than they, than they would on in Indian rupees or US dollars or any other alternative. You get a lot, you get a lot of a Asian money coming in right, right away because of arbitrage. So uh, the next question that is from a view of um, uh, uh, international agreements. So uh, the dear professor, the carbon net zero agreement that was signed recently by local authorities under the conditions of different agreement seems to produce more trouble for developing countries like Sri Lanka, while UK and other developed countries are willing to expand crude oil production to have a significant advantage of production cost. So how do you, how do this type of agreements affect to go forward without having serious issue? Well, this, this gets into a, a complicated uh, yes. analysis. Uh, what, what you're suggesting is that they signed a bad agreement, <laughs> which might be true, by the way. But I, I think in I think in, in reality that there, there's one there, there there are two things going on. One is the agreement, and two is the reality of what they're actually going to do. And I think most of these countries are simply not going to live up to the agreement. 
because the, the, there, there's no such thing as a green free lunch. That's the point. There's no such thing as a green free lunch. And in, and in Sri Lanka in this crisis and so forth, I, I can't imagine that they're going to be spending too much time worrying about a, a, a green lunch of any kind. They're, they're worried about surviving now, not in 100 years. So we do, with that, we do have two questions from one uh, participant. Uh, at the moment, we have zero reserves. How long would it take to establish a currency board and how? And if we establish a currency board, how long will it take for policy rates to naturally come down to lower single digits? What do you think? Well, you can, you know, you can establish one within 30 days. There's no question about it. I, I, I've done it. So, so I'm, it's not a theoretical exercise. I've done it in Estonia in, in 30 days. So that's that's point one. And bringing the interest rates down to single digits, I, I can tell you that in Bulgaria, we had a hyperinflation of 242% put in the currency board. And, and within 30 days, the interest rates were in single digits. And I, I remember the president, uh, President Stoyanov, I put in the currency board and after 30 days, the president and I met and he, he, he said, professor, he said, he says, I can't believe it. He said, this thing's working better than, he, than, than even you said it was going to be working. And so we, we were we were within high single digits within 30 days, nominal interest rates. And by the way, by the way, in one year, in one year, we were down to 2.4 percent interest. In Bulgaria. That, that is a great example we do have uh, to compare the situation here in Sri Lanka. So uh, with that, uh, uh, we do have another question with regard to the treasury bond scam, which is happened in 2015. So uh, I don't know whether you are aware about the bond scam, but uh, one, one of the participants is asking about, uh, do you suppose that the central bank says treasury bond scam matter became a turning point to drastic collapse of the Sri Lankan economy? So um, in my view, it has impacted uh, negatively because it has impacted the government revenue. So, but it happened in 2015, not recent. Uh, the, I, I, I don't know the details about that, so I really can't, I can't intelligently make a comment. Yes. So thank you very much. Uh, so with that, we can proceed with the next question, sir. Um, But by the way, just in general, it's pretty clear that, that there's so much corruption uh, it, 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 that this is this this is this is a major thing with the currency board. The currency yes. board does what? It, it's the best corruption fighter you can get because it puts the politicians in a straitjacket. It, it does mitigate corruption. It, it it will not eliminate it but it mitigates it. Absolutely, sir. So uh, with that, we can proceed with the next question. So uh, let me read out the question. So, uh, so President Ranil said, having more money in the hands of public will impose the economy. Is it true? So with the, I mean, uh, theories of the inflation, so it is incorrect, as for my knowledge. So, what what is your view? <laughs> well, I can. I, it, it, you, the the thing is, you you have to put the, the the right amount of money in the economy, and the only way to do that is let the market determine it with a currency board. the The amount of money going into the economy with a currency board is strictly a function of the demand for the local money, the, the, the demand for the rupee. That, that is the only thing because the supply with a currency board, the supply is totally elastic. So, so it, 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 
it, it's totally elastic, the supply of rupee under a currency board system. So what determines the quantity of rupee that's circulating in the economy? Only one thing, the private demand for rupee. That is the only thing that determines it. There's no politician determining it. The market determines it. It's a, it's a pure free market system for determining the quantity of money in circulation and the quantity of money in the hands of the public. So uh, with that, we do have another long question. So thank you very much, sir. But Sri Lanka is already having a comparably uh, higher public sector, some essential SOEs. If a currency board is implemented, what will happen to the payment to these people with the limited fiscal capacity of the government? Does it automatically direct for a uh, squeezed public sector? And what about the public welfare? So we uh, discussed this uh, well, question earlier also. Uh, the, 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 again, uh, the politicians will have to figure out how, how they're going to finance the pay of, of the public sector or, or if they're going to have a re reform of the public sector. This is should be part of the first reforms. The first reforms should be looking at this. And, and my recommendation in that regard is that the, the civil servant should know with some certainty what, what's going to happen. What's the plan? And, and, and they, they should be protected. So, so the, 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 but, but that, again, that has nothing to do with the currency board directly, only indirectly. The currency board will give you stability so that the politicians can face reality. What is the reality? You have a lot of civil servants. You're not going to throw them out in the street with no pay. You're going to organize something for for their for their retention, their retirement, their pay, structure of things, and so forth. All, all of these things have to be dealt with logically and rationally and, and carefully. But 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 they can you can do that if you have a currency board and, and stability. Now you can't do that. Now the civil servants don't know what's going on. They don't even know if they're going to get paid next month. So with that, we do have one question from one of our postgraduate students. Uh, so he's asking, when designing the macroeconomic policy of Sri Lanka, is it a good thing to focus on the tourism and agricultural production at the moment since service sector basically they uh, run the economy more than 50 percent of the sri lankan economy so um, where should be our focus as a country what should be our well, focus the the focus should be the embrace of the the singapore model <laughs> that's that's where you should go and 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 not worry about the the, the question implies that you have a plan no you should have no plan you should have a vision of what you want to accomplish a general vision and general rules of the game and and do exactly what singapore did under lee kuan yu currency board have a competitive economy you're asking, well, how much agriculture, how much service? No, have free trade and a competitive economy and, and let, the, let the market work out. What, how, how much, how, is agriculture good for Sri Lanka? Is services better? The market will, will determine all of those things. You, you don't need any central macroeconomic plan. We're not talking about the Soviet Union here. That's the problem. I mean, that's basically a big problem with Sri Lanka, by the way. The mentality is very Soviet. It's it's always been very Soviet in, in Sri Lanka. And and that's still that and that's that's another reason why Sri Lanka's in always in trouble. 
because you, you've got the elites. The elites are thinking like old Soviets. So uh, with that, we do have one interesting question, sir. Dear sir, if the politicians are unwilling to go to a currency board due to obvious reasons, what sort of pressure can the public create to persuade them? Do you have any practical experience of similar nature? So what are the consequences if you are unable to proceed with the currency board? Well, the practical, I, I mean, let's assume that that's the case. And, and, and then Sri Lanka will just keep going down. It's not, it's not going to go anyplace. I mean, you can forget it. So, so what, what the public has to do is, is get behind those politicians who are interested in stability and, and growth in Sri Lanka and, and interested in the possibility of changing the monetary arrangement so that, so that you change course. But, but, but the question is interesting because public opinion is the key thing. Because, because no politicians and no elites can survive if public opinion is against them. So if all the public opinion is convinced that the currency board and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a stable rupee is good, then you will get politicians who ultimately come around and agree with public opinion. Because e even in a dictatorship, the dictator has to abide by public opinion to a certain degree. So, so, so start, starting a, a, a two-pronged exercise is really what's needed. The public opinion has to be behind the idea, and then the politicians will come behind it. Now, let me go back to Bulgaria. In Bulgaria, in 1991, Kurt Schuller and I wrote a book called Teeth for the Bulgarian Lev, a currency board solution. That was 1991. No, no one, none of the politicians got behind this idea. I went to Bulgaria many times trying to sell the idea of a currency board. And they, the local elite said, oh, no, we, we know what we're doing. Everything's under control. Uh, professor, you're, you're just talking about theory here. We, we're here. You don't, un you don't understand the local situation. On and on and on. Then 1996, the, the hyperinflation broke out. And with that, another book that Schuler and I wrote was, was 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 hijacked basically and and translated into Bulgarian and it was a currency board book and that book in December of 1996 was the best selling book in Bulgaria that's the public the public was buying it they they wanted to know what is this currency board thing we're we're getting killed with hyperinflation so so the support for the idea came before the politicians got on board. Then the president of Bulgaria, Stoyanov, was smart enough to realize where public opinion was going. He called me and invited me to become his advisor when? In January of 1997, the month after my book became the number one bestseller in Sofia, Bulgaria. So. So the public is very much part of the thing and educating the public, getting the public behind the idea. Because if the public's behind it, then there'll be some politician in the elite that gets behind it. And, and that's, that's how it's done. Due to time constraints, um, so uh, we have to, I mean, is, uh, wind up the Q&A session, but I will put you one last question, sir. What are the challenges in adopting a currency board? Well, technically, there are, there are no challenges. I, I've done it before. I, I know I know how to do it. It's not. It's not. It's it's not. That's not. That technical part is not a problem. 
the problem is just what we're talking about getting a key politician who's who has enough influence to say this is what we're going to do and and they get the public behind that politician that that's the key to the thing because then you go to the imf which we did in bulgaria and and the president and the prime minister said to, to the imf oh we we want to change the idea that we have about the monetary system we want a currency board and in that case the imf is obliged by the way to say yes if you look at the articles of the imf the imf does not have the authority to dictate to people what to do if the locals tell the imf what they want done then the imf evaluates that request and and they, they move forward so the key thing is 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 a local poli the local politicians either either they will run the show and adopt the idea or they will not a, a, adopt the show and they will not adopt the idea so that's that's it's it's the problem it's a political problem yeah. well, thank you very much for your uh, wonderful insights sir I take it as a great pleasure and honor to moderate this discussion. We do have five to six additional questions. We will post it to your email and would like to proceed the answers through emails for the respondents who made those questions. Oh, that'll be fine. So uh, with that note, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Disal Akanpal, Regional Marketing Manager of Emerald publishing in order to deliver the vote of thanks. It is over to you, Disa. Thank you so much, Professor Devasri. What a, what a wonderful and engaging session. Uh, dear all, I, on behalf of Emerald Publishing and the Faculty of Management Studies of the Sabragama University of Sri Lanka, extend a very, very hearty vote of thanks to the main speaker, Professor Steve H. Hankey. Uh, inflation guru for giving us and gracing us with your important work and sharing your valuable advice, guidance, experience and opinions on the Sri Lankan economic crisis and the way forward today. At the onset I, onset, I would like to express my gratitude to Faculty of Management Studies of Sabragama University of Sri Lanka and Emerald Publishing in conducting this timely webinar as a part of the ICMR Conference 2022. I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Atula Gyanapala, Professor Devasiri, Professor Aslam, uh, Dr. Gamage, and Ms. Sangeeta Menon, Publishing Relationship Manager, Emerald Publishing, in making this value, uh, valuable webinar a success. Finally, I would like to extend a sincere thanks to the audience, all the academics for their for from the universities worldwide, researchers, economists, practitioners, students, and other invited guests for their active participation. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, a webinar like this cannot happen overnight. The wheels started rolling more than a month ago. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very, very motivated and dedicated colleagues. So I'm extremely grateful to all the members of Sabragama University of Sri Lanka for their continuous support. Uh, thank you all once again. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time today. And uh, we hope you enjoyed, you, you all enjoyed the session. Thank you. Thank you for thank providing. See you. Thank you, sir. Bye bye. Have have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. So it went very well. It was pretty thorough, as you can see. And uh, I think it'll.